We determined uh, the yo-yo intermittent recovery performance at the beginning of the season. These are the values for the second team, third team, under 18, under 17, when they came back from vacation. These were their values over Christmas. So we managed to get a 40% improvement in the yo-yo test performance uh, within those four months and a 20% improvement in the junior teams. Again, I don't think this once a week session was the only reason for those improvements, but I think, and I'm persuaded, and all the coaches were, and all the players were as well, that these sessions contributed very much to the players getting their aerobic power up and therefore getting more involved in all the training activities uh, that were performed in addition to these particular sessions. In terms of fatigue resistance uh, during high intensity intermittent sports, uh, I want to talk a little bit about a study that we did uh, a few years ago at, uh, in Bilbao. It was a collaborative study between Athletic Bilbao, the Institute of Exercise and Sports Sciences of the University of Copenhagen, Aspire Academy, the Australian Institute of Sport, and Amisco System. The purpose of the study was two, twofold. Firstly, we wanted to assess the concordance among four methods of match analysis during real match play in highly trained football players. So we wanted to compare the results of the Amisco system with a one hertz GPS system, with a five hertz GPS system, and with classic um, video-based time motion analysis. And the second goal was to examine fatigue development in football match play through time motion analysis and physiological assessments. For, that, for those goals, we organized a 94-minute uh, experimental match between our second team and our third team at uh, San Mamesa Stadium that has the, uh, the camera system that uh, requires the Amisco. So we did time motion analysis, as I said, with four different methods. We used the Amisco system of the stadium. We put a GPS unit on each one of the 20 players. We didn't assess the, uh, the uh, performance of the goalkeepers. On top of the GPS, players were wearing a, a T-shirt with a little pouch in which we inserted the uh, Minimax X unit. We had 20 digital cameras with 20 forced volunteers recording the movements of each one of the players. We assessed urinary specific gravity when the players arrived to the, uh, to the field. We assessed fluid balance before, uh, by weighing them before and after the game and by uh, measuring the amount of fluid ingested. We measured heart rate. We measured blood lactate uh, before the warm-up, after the warm-up, at halftime, and at the end of the match. We had uh, muscle temperature measurements before the warm-up, after the warm-up, halftime, and at the end of the match with three volunteers, again, forced volunteers from each team. Here you see Magni Moore carrying out these uh, intramuscular temperature measurements. And then we convinced the players, I don't know how, to uh, perform repeated jumping for half the players and repeated sprinting for the other half before the game and after the game. In terms of the uh, concordance among the different uh, match analysis methods, what we saw was that there were significant differences in uh, total distance covered, high intensity running, and sprinting among the four uh, match analysis methods. Those are the bad news. You cannot compare the values that you achieve or that you obtain with a MISCO uh, to the values that you obtained with a GPS unit or with uh, video analysis. The good news is that if we use relative values instead of absolute values, for example, if we consider that the distance covered in the first 15 minutes of the match is 100% of each player's performance, then we see that the drop in each subsequent 15-minute period is basically the same, no matter what system we are using. So as you can see here, the drop 
in the second 15 minute block, in the third 15 minute block, in the fourth 15 minute block is practically identical with the four analysis system. And that is true for total distance covered and it's also true for high intensity running during the game. When we looked at the, uh, the effects of the match on fatigue, we saw a fatigue effect. So here you see the total distance by using the mean of the Amisco system, the video, and the GPS. And what we found was that every 15 minute block, they covered less distance than the first 15 minute block. And we also saw that the last 15 minute block was lower than every previous 15 minute block. Exactly the same results for high intensity running, first 15 minutes, highest distance, significantly higher than every other 15 minute block, last 15 minute block significantly less than every previous 15 minute block. And exactly the same thing for a sprint in distance. So there is a fatigue effect there, which could be related with a dehydration effect. Here you see fluid balance. When we measured body mass before and after the match, we see a net fluid loss of 1.5 liters or about 2% of body mass, which is considered the uh, uh, value after which we can start seeing significant or very significant decrements in, uh, in players' performance. Another indicator of fatigue would be an assessment of heart rate. Here you see mean heart rate over the match, which was 172 or 89% of heart rate peak recorded during the match, but the interesting part is that in the first half, they spent 22.3 minutes above 95% of heart rate peak. In the second half, they were only able to spend 15 minutes above 95% of heart rate peak. I must emphasize that this was a match played in the heat. Blood lactate, we see that it was higher at the end of the first half than it was at the end of the second half, but we all know that blood lactate is very dependent on the activity that has been performed in the, immediate, in the minutes immediately preceding the, uh, the sampling, so this is not very meaningful. But when we looked at muscle temperature, you see the rest values were 36.5. Pretty much, that is after the warm-up, values went up to 38.3. After the first half, the mean values were above 40 degrees, and we had a couple players with, uh, with uh, intramuscular values of 42 degrees, which is very, very significant. Those values were lower at the end of the match. Repeated jump performance, again, another index of fatigue over the match. As you can see, there is a significant decrement in the average jump height in uh, 15 seconds uh, of repeated counter movement jumps and repeated sprint performance, we see exactly the same thing, a significant decrement in the mean running speed in three 30 minute sprints. And this is an important finding. Again, when we look at the relationship between the yo-yo intermittent recovery test result of these players and fatigue resistance, we see that there is a relationship. So those players who have a higher yo-yo intermittent recovery test performance are the players who cover more high intensity running distance in the last 15 minute interval of the match. So when everybody is dying off, those players who have very good yo-yo mm -hmm. test scores are the players who can make a difference uh, when everyone else is almost dead. So in conclusion for, for that study, all four systems were able to detect performance decrements during a football game and can be applied to study development of fatigue in elite football. But large between system differences uh, were revealed in the determination of the absolute distance covered, which implies that comparisons between systems should be done with caution. Pronounced game-induced fatigue occurs in the final stage of a high-level male soccer game played in the hot environment. And the ability to repeat intense exercise was highly compromised. 
and soccer-specific training status and the degree of dehydration play a role in this type of fatigue. Uh, another study that we did was to assess the effects of uh, sprint and power training programs, in-season sprint and power, power training programs in elite junior soccer players. Basically, what we wanted to, to do is, because we were su so successful in improving their aerobic uh, fitness, we wanted to know whether we could be as successful in improving their speed and power. So we compared two uh, short-term interventions. One of them was based on contrast training. As you can see, the description of the training content is much more uh, complicated. And sprint training. Every sprint in this training program was measured with uh, photocell gates. So it's just a progression of two times, four by 30 meters, blah, 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 twice, three, two sets, two sets, three sets, three sets, four sets, four sets. So an, an increment of the number of repetitions over time. What we saw was that uh, when we measured the, uh, the sprint over 15 meters, the, uh, the group that was involved in the contrast training had a significant gain, whereas the group that was involved in pure linear sprint training did not improve. Nor, not in the 15-meter uh, sprint test, nor in the 15-meter agility test. So if agility is considered to be important, if sprint, distance, if sprint time is considered to be important, and I think it is in football, contrast training resulted in a more uh, effective uh, 